Hello. Welcome once again, my friends, to our YouTube channel, Hematology and Blood Transfusion Science Lecture Series. Thank you very much for your support so far. You've been great. Thank you all. Today, we are going to have another exciting and important topic. Please permit me to share my slides with you. The topic we are going to be handling today is vitamin B12 metabolism, cobalamin metabolism. Remember, my name is Dr. Ifeima Mary Ann Okafo, a lecturer in the Department of Hematology and Blood Transfusion Science, College of Medical Sciences, University of Calabar. We'll be handling vitamin B12 metabolism today. At the end of this lecture, it is expected that you should be able to mention forms of cobalamin, sources of cobalamin, should be able to explain absorption, how cobalamin is absorbed in our body. It should understand, should have a good understanding of factors that can affect cobalamin absorption. And we should be able to explain functions of cobalamin in our system. Introduction. Vitamin B12, as it is commonly known, is the largest of the B complex vitamins with a molecular weight of over 1,000. Its generic name, the B12 is a generic name for a group of compounds called corinoids. They have four pyrrole rings. It contains, this pyrrole ring consists of a corin ring made up of four pyrrole with cobalt at the center of the ring. What we call Korean ring is actually a four pyrrole ring coordinated with a cobalt atom. A four pyrrole ring coordinated with a cobalt atom. Cobalt is a major trace element is a major trace metal in human with the average body containing about 1.1 grams of the element. And it is the third abundance in you know, trace element after iron and zinc. Although the nutritional researcher still call, you know, uh, vitamin B12, still names uh, vitamin B12, uh, this particular vitamin we are discussing today, vitamin B12. The most appropriate name is actually cobalamin. So that is why you see me using vitamin B12 or cobalamin. They actually mean the same thing, vitamin B12 or cobalamin. So in this particular lecture, I can uh, I may be using the two terms eh, interchangeably, but it's actually mean the same thing. Vitamin B12 is water soluble vitamin. It is heat soluble and it is red in color. And it contains about 4.35% covered by weight. It contains about 4.35% cobalt by weight. 
There are different forms of cobalamin. There are different forms of vitamin B12 that it is exist in different forms. We have cyanocobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin, and adenosylcobalamin. Cyanocobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, methylcobalamin, and adenosylcobalamin. Cobalamin occurs as supplements and in nature in two forms. We have vitamin B12 as supplements and in nature it occurs as cyanocobalamin and hydroxycobalamin. Cyanocobalamin and hydroxycobalamin. But in our body, cobalamin can only be used in the body in two forms. Cobalamin can only perform their function in the body in these two forms. As adenosylcobalamin or methylcobalamin. Cobalamin can perform their uh, function in the body in two forms. Either as adenosylcobalamin or methylcobalamin. Sources of vitamin B12. Where do we get uh, vitamin B12? That is cobalamin. In nature, human beings do not synthesize cobalamin. Human beings do not synthesize the vitamin B12. In, short, in nature, it's microorganisms such as bacteria and algae that actually naturally produce the cobalamin they naturally synthesize the cobalamin. The vitamin B12 synthesized in microorganisms enters the human food chain through incorporation into food of animal origin. In many animals, gastrointestinal fermentation supports the growth of this vitamin B12 synthesis in microorganisms. And subsequently, the vitamin is absorbed and incorporated into animal tissue. So the bacteria that are found in the gut of these animals, you know, keep synthesizing the vitamin B12 and they are subsequently, the vitamin is absorbed and incorporated into the animal tissue. So by the time we eat these animal tissues, we get a vitamin B12 from them. Therefore, human beings primarily get their uh, vitamin B12 or cobalamin by eating food from uh, animal origin, like meat, fish, milk, butter, egg. Food from animal origin, like meat, fish, milk, butter, egg. Now we've looked at sources of uh, cobalamin or vitamin B12. That is where we can get cobalamin or B12. Remember I said, you cannot get it from le uh, leafy vegetables. You can only get vitamin B12 from food of animal origins like meat, fish, butter, egg. Vitamin B12 cannot be found in cereals or leafy vegetables only from food from animal origin. Now, absorption of vitamin B12. When humans eat animal food, such as meat, fish, egg, most times the vitamin B12 is protein bound. The vitamin B12 is protein bound in this animal food. So when we consume it, we consume it as a complex that is this. So when the protein B12 complex passes through the esophagus and gets to our stomach. The vitamin B12 is released from the protein by the action of the high concentration of hydrochloric acid present in the stomach. Remember that our stomach is highly acidic. So when this protein bound uh, vitamin B12 from our diet gets to our stomach, the high concentration of this uh, uh, 
acid in the stomach helps to release this uh, vitamin B12 from the, from the protein complex. And this process results in the free form of vitamin, the vitamin B12, which is immediately, which is immediately bound to another protein. That is another protein secreted by stomach and salivary gland called hydrocorins or R binders. You can, some people, literatures use R binders, R proteins, haptocorins, or transcobalamin 1. Though these terms actually mean the same thing. When the protein bound vitamin B12 from our food gets to the stomach, Remember, the first thing is the, the high concentration of the hydrochloric, hydrochloric acid in stomach help to release free this uh, vitamin B12 from the complex of the protein. But because the, the, as the stomach is very acidic, the B12 cannot afford to stay unbound to protein because the high concentration of acid in the stomach can denature it. So it is immediately bound to another protein that actually protects it from being denatured by the high concentration of uh, high concentration of acid in the stomach so this protein is what we call R binders or hypocorins or transcobalamin 1 these glycoproteins are produced by the stomach and the salivary glands that is that R binders i will stick to the use of R binders our binders is actually produced by the stomach or salivary gland. These glycoproteins called our binders or haptocorins, as I said earlier, protect vitamin B12 from chemical denaturation of the stomach. The R binders pick up the B12 and transports it through the stomach and also takes it to the small intestine. This, uh, the stomach contains parietal cells. And the primary function of these parietal cells is to produce hydrochloric acid. That is the main acid that functions in the stomach. But in addition to production of this, secretion of this uh, hydrochloric acid by the parietal cell, these parietal cells also secrete another important protein called intrinsic eh, factor. This protein is actually what helps in absorption of vitamin B12. So I said here that the stomach parietal cells, which secrete hydrochloric acid, also secretes a glycoprotein called intrinsic factor, which travels to the small intestine. The stomach at this stage produces the intrinsic factor and removes to uh, the small intestine. When the B12 R protein complex gets to the small intestine, <clears throat> excuse me, the B12 is liberated from the R protein by enzymes made by the pancreas. And the cobalamin then attach itself to the intrinsic factor. The intrinsic factor binds B12 and ultimately enables its uh, active uh, absorption. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's look at it, what I just said closely. Remember that I said that when we eat vitamin B12 in our, as part of uh, animal uh, food that we consume, like say so we eat meat, fish, and food from animal origin, the vitamin B12 that is in these uh, food sources are protein bound. So when we chew them and swallow them, it gets into our stomach. When it gets to the stomach, the hydrochloric acid that is naturally found in the stomach helps to dissociate this vitamin B12 from the protein that is bound to. But the stomach is so acidic that if the B12 is not protected, it can get denatured by the acidic content 
have the stomach. So what happens? Another glycoprotein, which is produced by the stomach and can also be produced by salivary gland called R binder or haptocurrents, immediately binds this B12 in the stomach and carries it to small intestine. Now, the stomach, in addition to producing perioter, uh, producing hydrochloric acid by the perioral cells of the stomach, also produces what we call intrinsic factor. This intrinsic factor is actually the protein that helps in absorption of uh, B12, but it is produced by the perioral cells of the stomach and taken to the small intestine. So by the time the our binder B12 complex gets to small intestine, the intrinsic factor is already there. Now, the acidic pH, at an acidic pH, the affinity of the intrinsic factor for B12 is low, whereas its affinity for the R binder is high. Now, at the acidic pH, the affinity of intrinsic factor for vitamin B12 is low. Therefore, even though that intrinsic factor is produced in the stomach, it cannot bind B12 directly in the stomach because of the, the low pH of the stomach. It is highly acidic. Therefore, the acidic nature of the pH, the acidic nature of the stomach favors the B12 binding to R binders. Therefore, the R binders bind the uh, B12 in the stomach and carries it to small intestine where the pH is more alkaline in nature. The alkaline nature of the small intestine favors the bind, the dissociation of uh, B12 from the R binders and favors its binding to intrinsic uh, factor. So when the, when the contents of the stomach enters the duodenum, that is the upper part of the small intestine, the R binders become partly digested by the pancreatic proteases, which causes them to release the vitamin B12. Because the pH in the duodenum is more neutral than that in the stomach, the intrinsic factor has a high binding affinity to vitamin B12 in the uh, upper part of the intestine, and it quickly binds the vitamin as it is released from the R binders. So R binders carries the B12 to so the upper part of the small intestine, where the pH favors its dissociation from R binders and is binding to intrinsic uh, factor. And once it is bound to intrinsic factor, the intrinsic factor then carries the cobalamin to the la last section of the small intestine, the ileum. Once the, uh, the, the B12 is released from R binder in the upper part of the small intestine and quickly binds to the intrinsic factor at the upper part of the small intestine, the intrinsic factor quickly carries it from the upper part of the small intestine to the last section of the small intestine called the ileum. In the ileum, the complex attaches to a specific receptor and it is taken up by the mucosa cells. There at the ileum, remember the implicit factor B12 complex gets to the ileum and it attaches itself to a specific receptor that helps its cell absorption added by the mucosa cells. The cells lining the ileum contains receptors for the cobalamin intrinsic factor complex. The cobalamin intrinsic factor complex protects the cobalamin against bacterial and digestive enzymes degradation. That is, it protects, it protects the, uh, the intrinsic factor cobalamin complex enables its absorption and also protects it from being degraded by bacteria and digestive enzymes. The intrinsic, intrinsic factor receptor also, the intrinsic factor receptor also ensures that cobalamin will be given priority for absorption over other coronoids that may be present. So at the, 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 the 
B12 is absorbed at the last section of the uh, small intestine, that is at the ileum, by intrusive factor receptor. Intrusive factor produced in the stomach by parietal cells, binds to and taken to small intestine, binds to vitamin B12 and takes it to ileum where it enables a cell absorption. In the mucosal cells, vitamin B12 is released from its complexes and reaches the portal circulation. In the portal blood, it is transported in combination with transcobalamin 2. Transcobalamin 2 is the protein that transports B12 in the blood. Transcobalamin 2 is the protein that transports eh, B12 in the blood. It carries it to different cells where the B12 is used for different metabolic eh, processes. The vitamin B12 is presented to cells where it is taken up by the cells through receptor-mediated endocytosis. Passive diffusion. In addition, so intrusive factor mechanism of absorption of B12. You can also have passive diffusion normally accounts for one to three of B12 absorbed when obtained through normal source, food sources. Passive diffusion can also occur, especially uh, B12 that we take as supplement, you know, can also be uh, absorbed through the passive uh, diffusion. What it means is that they don't need the uh, intrusive factor, you know, mechanism for them to be able. But it's only a very small amount, about one to three percent. Storage. B12 is primarily stored in the liver. B12 is primarily stored in the liver, as in a complex with transcobalamin three. It's primarily stored in the liver, but it can, it can also be stored to some extent in leukocyte and gastric mucosa. It can also be stored, you know, to an extent in leukocyte and gastric mucosa. It's primarily stored in the liver and it is stored as a complex with transcobalamin 3. Transcobalamin 3. Now, let us have a closer look at what we have just described now. This is the diagrammatic explanation of what we just said. In the mouth, the B12, the unbound B12 can be absorbed through passive eh, diffusion under the tongue, especially the supplements, you advise to put it under the tongue so that it can be passively absorbed. So in the mouth, the unbound B12 can be absorbed, but the protein bound B12 moves through the esophagus and gets to the stomach. The protein bound B12 moves through the esophagus and gets to the stomach. In the stomach, enzymes and acid cause protein bound B12 to detach from the protein. So in the stomach, the enzymes and the acidic content of the stomach have to detach the B12 from the protein and it is quickly picks up by the R binders. The R binder, remember I said, is produced by the stomach and salivary eh, gland. And their work is to prevent B12 from being denatured by the acidic content of the stomach. So the R binders picks up this, uh, the R binder picks up the B12 and carries it to small intestine. And then in the stomach too, another important protein is also secreted, which is intrinsic factor. This is secreted by the parietal cells of the stomach. The parietal cells of stomach, in addition to secreting, in addition to secreting hydrochloric acid, also secrete intrinsic factor. And this intrinsic factor is secreted in the stomach, but start its work in the small intestine. In the small intestine, the upper small intestine, the R protein releases the B12 
because the pH of the small intestine favors its release from the B12 and, and the intrusive factor picks it up immediately so that it will not uh, be denatured in the upper part of the small intestine. In the upper part of the small intestine, they are putting the lysis B12 and the intrusive factor picks it up uh, immediately and takes it down to the lower small intestine, which is the ileum. There at the ileum, the intrusive factor B12 complex attaches to intrusive factor B12 receptor on the small intestine and then enables its absorption. The B12 attaches to and, and enables its absorption. And when it is absorbed, the B12 now attaches to a transport protein called transcobalamin 2. Transcobalamin 2. The transcobalamin 2 in the blood carries B12 to the body cells where it is used and to the liver where it is stored as a transcobalamin 3. The stored B12 in the liver, the B12 is stored in the liver and it can be released into the small intestine via by when it is there needed and the process continues itself again. The mouth, what happens in the mouth, the unbound can be absorbed through passive diffusion and then chewed and move down the protein bank to the stomach where enzymes and acid helps in dissociating it first and it quickly binds to R binders because the pH there favor is binding to R binders. In the stomach, intrusive factor is also produced and then the R binder moves the protein, the cobalamin straight to upper small intestine where the pH there favor is dissociation from R binder and quickly binds to the intrusive factor that has been produced in the stomach. And then the intrusive factor carries it straight to the ileum where it is uh, absorbed, enables its absorption through a complex intrusive factor B12 receptor on the intestinal cells. And inside the cells, it binds to transcobalamin 2 that transports it through the blood and is taken to cells where it is used or to the liver where it is stored. And it can be released later when the body needs it. What are the biochemical functions of the B12? What are the importance of B12? Why do we desire to have B12 in our diet? There are two reactions in mammals. There are two reactions in human beings that are dependent on vitamin B12. One is the conversion of hemocysteine to methionine. In this particular reaction, B12 serves as coenzyme in form of methylcobalamin. The second reaction is isomerization of methyl CoA to cysteine CoA. In this particular reaction, B12 serves as coenzyme in form of F deoxyadenosyl cobalamin. So there are two main reactions that B12 you know, catalyzes, serves as coenzyme. The, this, these two reactions are, and they are very, very important reactions in the system. One, conversion of homocysteine to methionine. In this particular reaction, B12 serves as a coenzyme, a form of methylcobalamin. And the second reaction is isomerization of methylcoA to cysteine CoA. And in this particular reaction, B12 serves as a coenzyme in form of 5 adenosyl cobalamin. Now let us take a closer look at the synthesis of methionine from hemocysteine. That is the first reaction where you have B12 functioning as a coenzyme in the system. That is a conversion of hemocysteine to methionine. Methylcobalamin, like I said earlier, is essential for the conversion of hemocysteine to methionine. And in this particular reaction, another important thing takes place. There is formation of tetrahydrofolate from methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is actually the reaction that joins B12 and folate together. Because tetrahydrofolate is the active form of uh, folate. When I, mean, when I say folate, I mean folic acid, which we are going to discuss in our next uh, lecture. 
The reaction is catalyzed. This particular reaction that is synthesis of methionine from homocysteine is catalyzed by homocysteine methyl transferase. And you can see it here that homocysteine is converted to methionine. And in this particular reaction, you have an enzyme homocysteine methyl transferase, which can also be called methionine synthase. And methylcobalamin serves as a co-enzyme. Methylcobalamin is a form of vitamin B12. In this reaction, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate is converted to tetyl, uh, tetrahydrofolate, which is active form of uh, folate. Now, what is the significance of this particular reaction? Now, the circulating methyl tetrahydrofolate in this particular reaction is converted to tetrahydrofolate. The tetrahydrofolate is either used for storage as polypolyglutamate form, or it is used for other reactions such as formation of methylene tetrahydrofolate. That is folic acid. It is very important. We tell vitamin B12 being present. The active form of folic acid cannot be generated. And remember, by the time we treat folic acid, you understand that folic acid is very, very important in the synthesis of DNA, RNA, amino acid, many proteins in the system, nucleic acid. So we tell B B12 being present to help in generating this active form of folic acid. So many important metabolic processes in our system will be affected. Now, that what we call methylfolate trap that occurs in vitamin B12 deficiency. In vitamin B12 deficiency, there is impaired conversion of methyl tetrahydrofolate to tetrahydrofolate, which results in accumulation of methyl tetrahydrofolate, and this is called methylfolate trap. So when B12 is not available to help in generating this active form of folate, what we call methyl folate trap can occur, and which, if you take it further, can also lead to a form of anemia that we are going to discuss later, megaloblastic anemia and other um, uh, disorders in the system. A significance of the reaction continues. Remember, we are discussing conversion of uh, homocysteine to methionine. Then methyl folate trap results in decreased availability of tetrahydrofolate and tetrahydrofolate derivatives that are needed for pyrrolene nucleotide and thymidylate uh, synthesis. These are precursors of uh, DNA. Thus, vitamin B12 deficiency results in secondary folate uh, deficiency. Vitamin B12 deficiency results in secondary folate uh, deficiency. Now, the second reaction that vitamin B12 catalyzes in the system is isomerization of methyl CoA to cysteinyl CoA. Now, degradation of, of all chain fatty acids and some amino acids like valine, leucine, etc., and pyrimidines, that is thymine and uracil, produce propinyl CoA and important compound methyl malonyl CoA. Now, methyl malonyl CoA mutates in this particular reaction, converts methyl malonic CoA to cysteinyl CoA in the presence of vitamin B12. And the form of vitamin B12 that is involved in this particular reaction is 5 adenosyl cobalamin. That is what is involved in this reaction. Remember, if you can cast your mind back, in hemoglobin synthesis, the first reaction in hemoglobin synthesis is the condensation of cysteinyl CoA with glycine. This cysteinyl CoA, if it is not available, we actually affect uh, hemoglobin uh, synthesis. So vitamin B12 is involved in a conversion of propionyl CoA to cysteinyl uh, CoA. And in this particular reaction, methylmalonic CoA mutase is involved in conversion of methyl malonic CoA to cysteinyl CoA. Methyl malonic CoA mutase is the enzyme that is involved in the conversion of methyl malonic CoA to cysteinyl CoA. But 
Vitamin B12 is involved in this reaction as a coenzyme, and it is in form of a 5 adenosyl cobalamin. Methyl malonic CoA, in absence of B12, to convert methyl malonic CoA to cysteine CoA, methyl malonic CoA accumulates and is excreted in urine as methyl malonic acid. So when the body is deficient of vitamin B12, you have accumulation of methyl malonic CoA. And because it is not there, it is excreted in urine, and you can have a condition called the methyl, have acidulia, methyl malonic, malonic acidulia, which occurs in vitamin B12 deficiency. Again, in deficiency, you have demyelination. That's myelination of nerves is impaired in B12 deficiency due to accumulation of methyl malonic CoA. And demyelination is due to excessive accumulation of methyl malonic CoA that occurs in B12 deficiency. Remember that B12 is needed as 5 adenosyl cobalamin to convert methyl malonic CoA to cysteine CoA. Remember that cysteine CoA, among other things, is needed in hemoglobin synthesis. Daily requirement. Adults need at least one microgram per day, while pregnant women and lactating mothers need about at least two micrograms per day. Factors that can affect absorption. Poor diet. When you are eating food that are not rich in animal uh, food sources, like food that are not rich in meat, it don't have enough meat, you know, um, fish, you don't eat egg, you know. And um, remember I said that you can only get vitamin B12 from food from animal eh, origins, food from animal eh, origins. So when you don't, your food is not rich in this uh, uh, food sources, you may not be able to have enough um, vitamin B12. Again, vegans, vegetarians, those that eat dwell only on, you know, eat only vegetables, they don't eat meat. Those people frequently suffer from B12 deficiency because you cannot get B12 from leafy vegetables or grains. Now, it, it, where we lack intrusive factor, anybody that lacks intrusive factor can also suffer from B12 deficiency because the main protein that is involved in the absorption of B12 is what? Intrusive factor. This could be, you know, as a result of gastrectomy, or that is removal of the stomach, or it can be auto, due to autoimmune diseases, resulting in the body not being able to produce them. Uh, in autoimmune diseases, in the body not being able to produce intrusive factor, maybe something happened to the parietal cells of the stomach, therefore the person cannot produce intrusive factor. It can also be congenital. You know, from birth, the person just lacks the ability to produce intrusive factor. I want to also state here that the what, anemia that that actually developed as a result of an individual not having intrusive factor at all is called pernicious cell anemia. It can be congenital, it can be acquired. Congenital in the sense that the person just lacks the ability to produce intrusive factor. Acquired in the sense that you know, over time, the person may be suffer some element that destroy parietal cells, and the person may not be able to produce them intrusive factor. Another thing that can affect absorption is diseases of the ileum. Any disease that can affect that uh, lower side part of the small intestine, because um, B12 is absorbed at the uh, lower part of small intestine, that is the ileum. So any disease that can affect that can also affect them, B12 absorption, like colon disease, you know, or an ilica, you know, any disease that can affect that ilica restriction reduces absorption of the B12 intrusive factor complex, okay? Another thing that can affect absorption is insufficient transcobalamin, that is a congenital deficiency can prevent B12 from entering the target cells. This means there is a deficiency despite there being sufficient B12. 
where you don't have transcobalamin to transport the B12 in the body, it can also affect its distribution in the system. What are the causes of B12 deficiency? You have inadequate intake as seen in pure vegetarians. Those people that eat only vegetable, they don't eat meat, they don't eat fish, you know, they can have um, frequent B12 deficiency. Then impaired absorption due to diseases that affect the ileum can also cause a deficiency. Now, there can also be a lack of intrinsic factor. When somebody cannot produce intrinsic factor, which is the primary protein involved in the absorption of uh, B12. Excretion. If the circulating B12 exceeds the binding capacity of the blood, and if not stored, the excess is excreted in the urine, and this normally happens only after B12 injection. The excess can be excreted in urine, and at times this only happens most times during after, after B12 uh, injection. Another thing I want to mention here is the relationship between B12 and cyanide poisoning. Remember I said that B12 has the largest and most complex chemical structure of all the vitamins. And on the same note, B12 is the only vitamin that contains the meta, that is cobalt, iron, bonded to a buffering like talatin air agents. So how does it work in treating cyanide toxicity? How does B12 work in, in treating cyanide toxicity? Hydroxycobalamin combines with cyanide to form cyanocobalamin, which is linearly cleared. So in cyanide poisoning, one of the things that is used in treating cyanide poisoning is vitamin B12, because it contains that cobalt atom, which actually combines with the cyanide to form cyanocobalamin, which can be uh, renally uh, cleared. So in cyanide poisoning, B12 is very, very important. Hydroxycobalamin, when given as supplements, combines with cyanide that the individual has taken to form cyanocobalamin, which is generally cleared. Folate and B12 deficiency give rise to what we call megaloblastic care anemia. Folate and B12 deficiency give rise to what we call megaloblastic anemia. And this is going to be handled in the next lecture. Please try and keep a date with us. Try and keep a date with us. These are the resources you can for further reading. These are the resources for further reading. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I know that you have learned one or two things from today's lecture. Remember what we treated, vitamin B12, which you can also call cobalamin. I said forms of cobalamin, thiamine, hydroxy, cobalamin, methylcobalamin, adenosyl cobalamin. And I'm sure that at this stage, you can actually mention functions of cobalamin in the system and also mention the reactions, the biochemical reactions that are being catalyzed or where cobalamin functions as cool enzyme. Thank you very much. Keep a date with us because we are going to be handling the next class, folate metabolism and subsequently megaloblastic anemia. Thank you.